Ephesians 4, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful today for your blessings to us. We're thankful that you've given us the opportunity to be able to preach your word, to be able to uh, meet together, Lord, to, uh, to, to uh, be able to uh, fellowship with one another. Lord, we pray you bless in the service, in the baptism, and Lord, uh, we pray that you would uh, use uh, your word in a great way today, that your people be strengthened and edified, and Lord, that truly we would worship you in spirit and in truth. Our Father, we pray that you bless each home represented here today, each church represented as well, Lord, and we pray that you would um, uh, uh, be with those that could not make it. We mentioned several today, Brother uh, Kenny and Sister Jennifer, we ask thy blessings upon them, Brother Joe and Sister Mary, Lord, uh, we pray for them as well. And of course, Lord, there's many others uh, that, uh, that, that, that we mentioned this morning. Uh, we pray that you would just watch over and take care of each one. Uh, raise them up so that they can be back with us the next appointed time, if it's in your will. Be with those that live at far distances, Sister Marilyn. Also, uh, uh, Brother Jim, uh, we, we ask thy blessings upon them. Uh, we pray for... Brother Josh, uh, up, up, in, uh, up in Canada, Lord, we pray that you watch over him and his family as well. And we pray that you will forgive us for our sins and our shortcomings. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4. Try to fix this a minute. Whoever's on Facebook watching, sorry about that. Hope they're not too dizzy by now. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4, and uh, we'll begin reading at verse 4. <clears throat> it says here, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Uh, the subject this morning is uh, biblical look at baptism. Uh, it could be, uh, it could be that uh, we just call it baptism because if you're not looking at it scripturally, it's no baptism at all. It's just a getting wet. Um, you know, as I was, as I was studying this and looking into it and, and really reading some some different things about it, I find it. Uh, it's a very important subject. God's Word only recognizes one kind of baptism. Amen. And uh, whenever you go through history, uh, the history of the Lord's churches is a trail of blood. Uh, the Lord promised perpetuity to His kind of church, uh, telling us that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. With that perpetuity, we find... Uh, words like uh, chain link succession and, 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 and so on and so forth. But what it boils down to is this. The church of Jesus Christ, the one that he established during his earthly ministry, has birthed other churches down through the ages until our present day. And to those churches, and only to those churches, has he given the authority, as we'll look at, uh, to administer baptism. Now, whenever you look at history though, and it doesn't matter whether you're looking at the looking at folks who were called Christians, if you're looking at folks who were called Waldenses or Albigenses or Donatists, if you're looking at any of those groups, and there were a bunch of others, the Anabaptists, that is the one reason that is above all the other reasons of why church history, true church history, is a trail of blood. More blood has been shed, more preachers put in jail, more church folks have been persecuted over the subject of baptism than any other subject. No other doctrine has gotten us into trouble, more trouble with other groups than baptism. 
And so, if anybody ever comes to you and says, well, I don't really look much at baptism, or I don't care too much about baptism, or I don't teach baptism, or they try to say that baptism is a non-essential, they are wrong. They're very, very wrong. It makes a difference. It makes a world of difference. And we've got to we've got to make sure we hold on to this doctrine. The, the truth about baptism. Uh, if there were no difference between our baptism and the baptism of the Methodists or the baptism of the Presbyterians, or for that matter, the baptism of the Pope, then what in the world are we doing? Why are we even bothering with what we're doing today? But there is a reason. There is a reason why it matters. If you turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for all thus, for, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, Lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus thought enough about baptism that he went a long ways, uh, about 60 miles as a matter of fact, to walk uh, to be baptized, uh, to make sure that he was given proper baptism because at that time there was only one who had authority to baptize and his name was John if it didn't matter if it was of no consequence Jesus could have remained unbaptized or he could have just grabbed somebody else said hey Bob hey Joe hey Frank uh, whoever, come give me in the water. I'd like to be baptized. But he didn't do that. He went where the authority was, where the water was, and was baptized of John. It matters a lot. It's in the book of Acts chapter 19. There's a springboard into our message here as well. In Acts chapter 19... Begin verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should af come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now I suppose that had there been a Catholic or Protestant uh, reformed kind of a church in the area. I use the term very, very loose, loosely there. But if there was a Catholic or Protestant in the area, I suppose that Paul would have been given the nickname Anabaptist. And we'd be reading something in here. After all this, it would say, and, and the disciples were called the first Anabaptists in Ephesus. Uh, but there was none there to give him that kind of a nickname. For at that time, there was but one church. That was the Lord's church. It's interesting to see what some of the commentators uh, say about 
Acts chapter 19. But the fact is, what happened here is that these men were not baptized by John, apparently. They were baptized by someone else who had been baptized by John. That person lacked the authority to, uh, to, to, to baptize because John was never commissioned, never told to go and give his authority to other people. He never had that kind of, uh, that never, he, he never had, had that kind of commission. So whenever you get into the commentaries, it's kind of interesting to see how these Protestants and these Catholics and some of them will will say some things and try to talk about it but and skirt around the issue. But no matter what they say, no matter how they want to put, put it out, the fact is this. Paul had a group there. And with that group, there was unscriptural baptism followed by scriptural baptism. That's the facts. Not a Catholic, not a Protestant, not wishful thinking, not a Reformed Baptist. Nobody can change this. If baptism didn't matter, Paul would have just left them where they were. But he didn't. He baptized them properly as they needed to be baptized. They had never been baptized before. What are the elements... What is necessary for scriptural baptism to happen? Well, I believe there's four things. You've got to have the proper authority. You've got to have the proper candidate. You've got to also have the proper mode. And then also, you've got to have the proper design. And we'll look at these each individually. First of all, the proper authority. In John chapter 1 and verse 6. John 1 and verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. John the Baptist. It was God that called him the Baptist. John the Baptist was given a authority from God. As we've seen, Jesus recognized that authority, walked 60 miles to make sure to be baptized by the one who had the authority. All scriptural baptism has to be done with proper authority. The authority doesn't rest in the preacher. The authority rests in the church, as we'll see in just a moment. But without authority, there can be no baptism. Look in Matthew chapter 28. I got ahead of myself for just a little bit, but Matthew 28, verse 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lord, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So, Jesus met with His church, His, his little flock. These eleven, you might call them the, uh, the, 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 uh, the first church at Jerusalem. If you were to give them a name, we'd call them the first Baptist church of Jerusalem. And uh, they met there and Jesus gives them authority. He says, all power, all authority uh, is given unto me. Go ye therefore. Uh, he commissioned them to go out into the world, preaching the gospel, and then uh, baptizing those who are saved in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And then to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. He told them, he said, Lo, I'm with you all the way even to the end of the world. So that tells me that this didn't die with the apostles. He said the end of the world, and last I checked, we've still got a world to live in. 
So he gave this authority to his church. And we find that the Lord's churches were given this authority by Jesus Christ, our one and only head. And only those churches which have descended from that first church in Jerusalem, only those churches have the authority to baptize. If your baptism comes from a church, they can be traced back to a man. You ain't got scriptural baptism. You may have a lot of them. Maybe you got some good teachings, but you didn't have proper baptism. If if your baptism came from a from a church that uh, descended from Rome, so a break off of Catholicism, you ain't got scriptural baptism because you go back and you look, the Roman reformers, they themselves believed that the church of Jesus Christ was the Roman Catholic Church. We know that Catholicism, uh, from studying history, came about way too late to be the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, whether you're looking at Luther, or Calvin, or any of the great reformers, again, they could teach some good stuff. And I appreciate the good things that they taught. But their baptism was Catholic baptism, which was no baptism at all. And so the churches that were formed as a result of their work are no baptism at all because quite literally if it's not the church of Jesus Christ it's no church at all. Amen. If it's not the baptism that scripture speaks of it's not baptism at all. Amen. And these are the realities of it. And the, the, some of these preachers that come from those denominations they may preach good sermons and they may be really good speakers but they have not the authority they have not the authority for baptism. They haven't even the authority to really be preaching. But that's a different subject. So there's got to be proper authority. But secondly, there's got to be a proper candidate. In Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruit to meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Only those who have been born again, only born again believers can be baptized. Uh, only those who have, who have repented of their sins, those are the ones who are proper candidates for baptism. Uh, whenever we consider this subject, we know that uh, John here, he had some folks who came, Pharisees and Sadducees. I believe they were curious about this thing called baptism. They had seen it. They wanted to take part of it. Uh, you know, maybe add another work to their, to their treasure chest. Uh, but John, John says, uh, you generation of vipers, who's warned you to flee from the wrath to come? He says, Bring forth uh, fruit, meat for repentance. And, um, and, and, and he tells them uh, to uh, and, 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 and don't think to say we have Abraham to our father. Uh, it's not enough to think that you've got some sort of a bloodline that will get you into heaven. He says, no, no none of that, none of that. Uh, it's always 
follow the formula of blood before the water. Always, you got to be washed in the blood of the Lamb before you ever step foot into the baptismal waters. Amen. Uh, in the book of Acts, chapter number 8. Acts 8, verses 36 uh, through 37 there. As they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He commanded the chariot to stand still. It went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. A couple days ago while I was studying, I put some of these points out on Facebook, on my personal page. And uh, whenever I got to this point, brought up Acts 8, 36 through 38 there, uh, somebody somebody said, well, it's not there if you use one of those modern translations. So I guess if you if you read, read this and you, you miss verse 37, if verse 37 is missing from your Bible, you probably uh, ain't got the right Bible. Uh, either that or your page is torn. Uh, but, um, but in the King James and in the original, uh, Verse 37 is there. The eunuch said to Philip, Hey, you've been telling me about, uh, about the Lord. You've been preaching me from Isaiah. We've been talking about all this. Here's water. What, what, what's stopping me from being baptized? The eunuch either had heard some things about the churches or Philip had told him, I don't know which. But he said, here's water. What, what, what's hindering me from being baptized? And Philip said, well, you've got to know the Lord before you can ever be baptized. And upon his confession of faith, then and only then, was the eunuch baptized. There's got to be the proper candidate. Prior to his confession, he was no candidate for baptism. The water might have been good for drinking. It might have been good for a lot of things, but it wouldn't have been good to baptize a person who's never been born again. In John chapter 3, John chapter number 3, Verses 22 to 23. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. There he tarried with him and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anan near to Salem because, why? There was much water there. And they came and were baptized. John needed to be baptized in a place where there was much water. Uh, scriptural baptism is immersion, and therefore much, must include much water. In the book of Acts chapter 8, we read it a while ago. Acts chapter 8 and verses uh, 38 and 39. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Immersion. You see there the wording that they, the eunuch and Philip, both went down into the water and they came up out of the water. 
It's very, very important that if you've been, if you've been born again, that you follow the Lord in scriptural baptism. That's important number one. Important number two is to be sure that whenever you're in, that, uh, that, that you go down and come back up. If you don't come back up, you might have other problems. But, you know, you'll see sometimes a missionary be baptizing uh, maybe some tribesmen from Africa or, or New Guinea or whatever, and you'll see them go down in the water, come back up, and you'll see the missionary do it again. You say, what's going on? And you rewind the tape or go back on the video and you realize, oh, I see it. Uh, his foot came up as he went down, or his hand went up as he went, and, and, and so uh, push him in again. Uh, so whenever I baptized Sister Nita, I was scared to death. I didn't think I was going to get her down in because she was scared of water. But it had to be. Had to be for proper baptism. It's got to be immersion. It's got to be immersion. The very word in the Greek is baptizo. The word that we get our word baptism is transliterated. It means immersion every time. From Matthew all the way to Revelation. Amen. Everywhere in between you will not find any other kind of baptism except immersion. Now, John Brodus in his Matthew commentary, I told you all I got that the other day. Uh... I appreciate Baptist commentators because uh, you can't, I mean, Matthew Henry is a great guy. He wrote some good stuff, but man, you can't, you can't trust him on baptism. You can't trust him on the church. Uh, same thing with some of these other commentaries, and so I appreciate Baptist commentaries. Uh, Tom Ross wrote a good one on the book of Acts. Uh, it's been very helpful to me whenever I'm teaching on the book of Acts, but um, Brodus lived in the 1800s, he wrote, he wrote a commentary on, on the book of Matthew. And I was reading through that uh, just to see what he said. And sure enough, he nailed it uh, on baptism. And I was excited. And then he, he put in there about some guy who had written years later uh, about that if there was no water, that uh, the word baptizo could mean pouring if there's not enough water. Um, I don't know what Brodus' intention was there. Um, obviously, he's not alive, so I can't talk to him about it. But this is what happens, though, when you start getting outside of the Scriptures. Uh, the guy that he cited as, as saying it lived after the New Testament was written. And his excuse was, well, if there's not enough water, you can have scriptural baptism with pouring. No, you can't. If you don't have enough water, then you ought to wait till you get some. I don't care if you got to collect it in a bucket or wait until the rain comes, if you're in the middle of a desert or whatever. But uh, uh, it's got to be immersion. Always in order to be scriptural. I mean, you could have, you could have the best Baptist church to grant you the authority. You have the proper candidate, but if all you do is dump water on their head, you ain't done baptism. You've made a fool of yourself, of yourself, and uh, disrespected the scriptures and offended our God. That's what you get whenever you steer outside of the scriptures. <clears throat> it's got to be immersion, because fourthly. The proper design of baptism is that it is not a sacrament, but it is an ordinance. It's not a sacrament, but it is an ordinance. Now, what I mean by that is there is no saving quality in those waters. I get asked sometimes at work, some of the some, some of the most interesting questions. The other day somebody asked me what kind of water I use. I didn't know what they were talking about. I said, well, I like to get the stuff from Kroger's, the purified water. It tastes pretty good. And uh, I believe he was being sincere. He was asking me about holy water is what he was asking. 
I think he was a little confused, maybe as confused as I was about it. But I, told, I, I explained to him, there's no salvation, no, uh, nothing special about water, except for the fact that once you're saved, you're following the Lord in baptism. It's an ordinance of the church. It's a picture. It's a picture. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, it says this, Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We're buried with Him by baptism unto death. The picture is the death of Jesus Christ. Uh, turn with me to the book of Colossians chapter 2 and then I'll make some comments here Colossians chapter 2 Colossians 2 verse 12 it says this Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. When a believer is baptized, she is publicly declaring her death to her old way of life, and she's raised it to walk in newness of life to serve Jesus Christ through the New Testament church. Uh, it, in, in, the, in the baptism we see, and like as Christ was buried, he rose again, so we also, uh, likewise, are raised to walk in newness of life when we are saved by his grace. It's, it's all a picture. All, and in order for the picture to be right, sprinkling and pouring just won't do it. You know, if my, if, if, if my, if my son's Lizard. That thing's getting pretty big, too. We call him Leviathan. He doesn't breathe fire or anything, but he's getting pretty big. If that thing dies, and I tell Isaiah to go out in the backyard and bury it, I mean for him to dig a hole. I mean for him to cover that thing up with dirt. If he comes in two minutes Later says, all right, Dad, I took care of him. I go out there and I see his lifeless lizard laying there with some dirt sprinkled on top of it. I'm going to be mad. He didn't listen. <clears throat> he didn't listen to what I told him. I said to bury him. He didn't dig a hole. He didn't cover it up. He just sprinkled dirt on it and said, Dad, I'm done. If he did that, he'd probably get a whipping for it because... He didn't listen and disobeyed me. Not to mention, an animal, whenever it's left out in the yard, it starts to stink if it's not buried properly. So he's got to do it right or else it'll stink. And I'm telling you what, we have to make sure that we're doing baptism right or else it will also stink. We've got to listen to what the Lord is telling us or else we have not done scriptural baptism. He says buried with Him. He said that we're to, we're, we're, we're to, uh, to go down in the water and come back up. He used the word. Baptizo. There's other words that could have been used if pouring or sprinkling was okay, but he didn't. He didn't. The picture has to be right. And uh, when it's not, you can have everything else lined up. It's, it's a symbol and it's figurative. It's not for salvation. I tell you, 
You mess up the you mess you mess up the, the picture. You messed up a lot of things. In Acts chapter two, Acts chapter two, verse forty one. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. There are essentially two requirements before a per person can ever be considered as a member of one of the Lord's true churches. That is salvation and baptism. It has to be in that order. When we think about baptism, it's not enough that someone comes and wishes to join the church. What we as the church need to examine to make sure that their baptism was scriptural. Because if it wasn't, then they need to be baptized. Uh, somebody might get offended or their feelings hurt sometimes with those things. But the fact is, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. And we've got to buy the truth and sell it not. We can't sell out for popularity, sell out for numbers, sell out to get along with other folks. Alien baptism is that which does not line up with the scriptures. It's no baptism at all. So we can't we can't take it. We will not take it. As our as our text says, and will bring us to a close uh, right before the actual baptism. Uh, Ephesians chapter four There is one body, one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Only one baptism. And that is biblical, scriptural, Baptist baptism. May the Lord bless you with this message. Uh, and uh, I'll have maybe Brother Ray come up and uh, we will sing a couple songs here while... I'll get in the water first. <clears throat> yes. Can I add a thought? Yes, sir. Please do. Whenever a person is baptized, you don't just baptize the head or the feet. You baptize the whole body. Mm -hmm. That's a symbol of the fact that your whole body is baptized in Christ. And your whole body is the service of Christ. It's a good thought. Thank you. Amen. I'll amen it from up here. <laughs> Appreciate that. So let's have a let's have some songs and uh, or maybe a few <clears throat> verses of a song, and then uh, I'll get in first, and then I'll have Leah afterwards. And we'll play it by ear. Yep. Take this down here. Play it by ear. 